Hello, I'm Esther Gito Ewart. It's Wednesday, February 16th. This is Africa 54. Burkina Faso's military leader Paul Henri Damiba was sworn in as president on Wednesday, just weeks after leading a successful coup. Damiba is promising to deal with rising insecurity that helped oust his predecessor. Damiba led a military junta that, that on January 24th overthrew former President Rock Kabore, citing Kabore's inability to curb an Islamist insurgency that has killed thousands of people and forced more than one million people to flee their homes. Damiba opened his speech at Wednesday's ceremony with a moment of silence for the civilians and soldiers killed in the fight against militants. He says he will reorganize the armed forces to strengthen the link between the intelligence service and field operation and will make logistical support more flexible. Africa has seen a rise in military coups in the past year with takeovers in Burkina Faso, Chad, Guinea, Mali and Sudan and a failed coup attempt reported in Guinea-Bissau. In an exclusive interview, former Ghanaian president and former African Union chairperson John Kufour says the coups are linked to factors that include poor governance. Kufour spoke to Kent Mensah in Accra, Ghana. In some instances where coups have happened. The governments have tended to lapse into misgovernance one way or the other. Either governments didn't take uh, care of their security arrangements, uh, uh, whether, uh, either they also didn't show appreciation of the geopolitics of the neighborhood. Do you think that regional blocs example, AU, ECOWAS, SADC, have not been more proactive in seeing some of this and they wait until there is a coup before they want to react. If these people would think uh, your banning wouldn't bite, yeah, you, the sanctions would not bite them economically or politically or socially. So they, they just carry on in spite of the declaration of the regional groupings. And for this, uh, uh, the, 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 the associations, the groupings, should begin to uh, really think seriously um, how to give the, the, the constitutional provisions the bite. So when they say, don't do it, and you do it, they can get you. Uh, so you know that uh, perhaps uh, it's not profitable for you to try it. You have suffered a um, coup um, at the point you were in government uh, mm -hmm. as a parliamentarian, mm -hmm. and then there was a coup d'etat at the point to you with your 83 um, years in government. Uh, a lot of our generation have not really felt how it is like to live under a military government. Could you share with us how it uh, felt? It's not an experience I would recommend to mm. any generation. So I wouldn't advise anybody to hail a coup d'etat. It comes from faceless people you do not know. You haven't given any thing to, to keep for you or to manage for you. And they may not even be competent enough to do anything. And if they come, they use an opportunity and they come to impose themselves on you and destroy your life for you. Is this what anybody should want? About the current leaders, um, leaders. yes. What, what kind of advice will you give them in dealing with some of these security concerns and also coup d'etat on the continent? Please try to live by your oath to the people. It's the underpinning of good governance. Mm -hmm. If you think uh, the period is too short, use the constitutional means to convince the people to say amend constitution or reform constitution, to say lengthen tenure a bit, but please don't play smart. Mm -hmm. And then even when you should be stepping down, 
say, you know, the people are, have decided and there's a third term, you do that. And then, in a way, uh, you, you push people into feeling they too can take things into their own hands to do what they mustn't do. That report was filed by Kent Mansa in Accra, Ghana. In a new report released Wednesday, human rights group Amnesty International says fighters affiliated with the Tigran People's Liberation Front and other armed groups in Ethiopia gang raped dozens of women and girls, some as young as 14 years old. Amnesty says armed groups also deliberately killed dozens of people and looted property in two areas of northern Ethiopia's Amhara region. The atrocities were perpetrated in and around Chena and Kobo in late August and early September 2021. Amnesty International's Deputy Regional Director for East Africa, the Horn and the Great Lakes, Sarah Jackson, said, quote, Tigrayan forces have shown utter disregard for fundamental rules of international humanitarian law. Nigeria state-run National Petroleum Corporation says it has started a 24-hour distribution of petrol to service stations to end a week-long scarcity that has caused traffic snarls in major cities. The shortage, which started last week in Abuja, has caused long lines with few stations selling fuel. Transport fares have risen in several cities, curtailing services and forcing some residents and workers to walk long distances to their destinations. Most homes in Nigeria also rely on petrol and diesel to power their generators as the public power supply is unreliable and prone to blackouts. The Nigerian National Petroleum Commission, NNPC, made the announcement in a statement late Tuesday. NNPC said it had stored up to one billion barrels of petrol ready to be distributed and has ordered its outlets nationwide to begin a 24-hour uninterrupted operation. Long lines for fields stretching many meters have lingered in Nigeria for weeks. Abuja, Lagos and Port Harcourt are the most affected cities. Last week, authorities recorded over 170 million barrels of adulterated petrol containing higher than stipulated amounts of ethanol which had been imported from Europe in January. Authorities said the removal of the tainted fuel from the market is the reason for the shortage. Nigeria is one of the biggest oil producers in the world and the largest in Africa, but the country relies heavily on imports to meet its energy needs. Experts say it could take some weeks of continuous imports for the situation to normalize. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. Thanks, Tim. A South African judge dismissed a bid Wednesday by former President Jacob Zuma to appeal an earlier ruling rejecting his attempt to have the prosecutor in his arms deal corruption trial taken off the case for alleged bias. The judgment means Zuma's trial will move forward on April 11th. Zuma, ousted as head of state in 2018 after nine years in power, has pleaded not guilty to charges of corruption, money laundering and racketeering in a long-running case over a $2 billion arms deal in the 1990s. Zuma claims he is the victim of a political witch hunt. Somali officials say Al-Shabaab militants attacked several police stations and security checkpoints in Mogadishu early Wednesday. A show of force as the nation prepares for a much-delayed presidential election. Vincent McCory has more. This is the devastation after Al-Shabaab militants attacked several police stations and security checkpoints in Somalia's capital Mogadishu early on Wednesday, according to officials and the militants. The attacks came as indirect parliamentary elections are held. Elections for lawmakers are currently due to be completed on February 25th. State TV reported that at least five people, including children, were killed in the attacks. Mohammed Abdi recalled the moment the attacks hit. We were asleep when we were woken up by a huge explosion and gunfire coming from the Kada police station, and we were shocked. Our house was also completely destroyed in the explosion. A spokesperson from the militant group said fighters hit government targets in four districts in the capital and another area on the outskirts. He said the militants overran government bases and seized military vehicles and weapons. It was not immediately possible to verify those claims. Speaking shortly after the attacks, a Mogadishu police per spokesperson said security forces were exchanging gunfire with the militants. He did not give further details. 
The Al-Qaeda-linked militants carry out frequent attacks against the government and last week attacked a minibus carrying election delegates. The United Nations representative in Somalia has expressed optimism that the elections will take place. While political, security and humanitarian conditions in Somalia are still fragile, I remain guardedly hopeful that the country will make further progress in these areas in the coming months and beyond. This requires Somali leaders to put their differences aside for the good of the Somali people and to conclude credible elections as soon as possible. This overdue step will then allow leaders to refocus their efforts on the full range of urgent national priorities. To this end, the international community continues to accompany the Somali people on this journey by providing the necessary support. A months-long dispute between Prime Minister Mohamed Hussein Robling and his political rival President Mohamed Abdullahi Mohamed has been blamed for the delayed presidential elections. Vincent McCory, Washington. U.S. President Joe Biden spoke to the American people and the Russian people Tuesday about the stakes of a potential invasion of Ukraine. Biden said if Russian President Vladimir Putin does invade his neighbor, it will be a war of choice that inflicts needless death and destruction. VOA diplomatic correspondent Cindy Sain reports. Russia says it has moved some of its military units away from its borders with Ukraine. But President Joe Biden spoke to Americans about the grave situation Tuesday, saying the U.S. has not verified those claims. The fact remains, right now, Russia has more than 150,000 troops encircling Ukraine and Belarus and along Ukraine's border. An invasion remains distinctly possible. Biden also addressed the people of Russia directly saying they are not an enemy of America. He said 77 years ago, the U.S. and Russia fought side by side to end the worst war in history. World War II was a war of necessity. But if Russia attacks Ukraine, it would be a war of choice or a war without cause or reason. I say these things not to provoke, but to speak the truth, because the truth matters. Meanwhile, in Moscow, Russian President Vladimir Putin met with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz Tuesday and told reporters he is ready to work further with the West to de-escalate tensions over Ukraine. Scholz told reporters that Russia saying it is pulling some forces back from the border is a hopeful sign. For my generation, war has become unthinkable in Europe, and we must ensure that it remains so. It is our damn duty and our mission as heads of state and government to prevent an escalation of war in Europe. Invasion fears remain high, as Ukraine said Tuesday that the websites of the country's defense ministry and armed forces and the websites of two state banks have been hit by a cyber attack, possibly of Russian origin. Cindy Sane. VOA News. Russia says that it has pulled some troops away from near Ukraine's borders. Meanwhile, NATO defense ministers are discussing plans to counter Russian aggression at a two-day meeting in Brussels. For more on the crisis, joining us live via Skype from Brussels is VOA Pentagon correspondent Carla Bob, who is traveling with U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Carla, what's the latest from NATO? From NATO. Well, NATO is very worried that this could be the new normal. I mean, they are saying basically that Russia has shown that it is not afraid to threaten the sovereignty of another nation and try to change its borders. And so NATO is very prepared to step up and make additional defensive measures if necessary. Uh, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg stressed that NATO wants diplomacy to rule the day here. NATO doesn't want Russia to invade Ukraine. NATO doesn't want a war on its eastern flank. And so they are trying to get Russia to meet them halfway. And Russia, for its part, has said that it wants diplomacy. And it has said even that it would pull some of those 150,000 troops away from the borders and near the borders of Ukraine, like you heard President Biden say they had. Um, but Jens Stoltenberg said that while they're saying it, they're not doing it. They haven't seen any sort of de-escalation on the ground. They have not seen 
any troops move away from those borders. In fact, he said they're seeing troops on their way to the border of Ukraine as we speak. Carla, given that situation, what else has NATO done to increase its defenses on the east? So NATO has done a lot already. Uh, if you, though, in, with the United States, the United States has um, sent 5,000 troops to Poland, for example. The UK has also sent some troops. The US sent some troops to Romania. Germany has sent some troops. The Netherlands has sent some F-35s as well. And Jens Stoltenberg said that, you know, in order to adjust to this new normal where Russia could potentially invade a country in Europe, that additional defensive measures may come. And he said he didn't want to get ahead of any announcements, but the, the NATO alliance is not afraid to defend itself. And while they won't be putting any offensive measures in Ukraine, they are going to make sure that their borders are defended. And uh, briefly, Carla, do we have any new comments from Stoltenberg on de-escalation efforts? So again, Stoltenberg reiterated that um, de-escalation hasn't been seen yet on the ground. That's what they want to see. That's what Russia says it's going to do. Russia says it's going to pull back its troops. But the U.S. and NATO have not seen that at this point. So moving forward, I expect that these NATO defense ministers today and tomorrow will be finalizing additional plans to make sure that the nations close to Russia are well defended, which may include additional troop announcements. Carla, thank you so much. VOA Pentagon correspondent Carla Bob reporting live via Skype from Brussels, Belgium. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, a popular Nigerian radio presenter discusses real-life challenges for women. But first, Hedy Adams tells us what's coming up on Wednesday's Trade Talk Africa. On the next Straight Talk Africa, we'll take a look at informal housing and unplanned communities. Is there a place for them in big urban centers? We'll look at what the mayor of Freetown, Sierra Leone, is doing, how she's bringing changes to her city, including its unplanned communities. We'll also talk to a Nigerian American who's making a big difference in affordable housing in Washington, D.C. Join me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. It's time for our tech segment, and joining us now is Africa 54 tech correspondent, Paul Ndiho. Paul. Thank you, Esther. Lagos, Nigeria, Bester Aldon Toys, a leading manufacturer of African-themed toys, Unity Dolls, has secured a multi-million dollar contract with Walmart to supply the dolls. The African-inspired dolls, completely with locally made clothes and accessory kits, are now available in Walmart stores across the United States. I spoke to Paul Orajaika, the CEO of Aldon Toys, earlier. Welcome back to Africa 54. Thank you, Paul. Glad to be here at any time. One of your products, the Unity Dolls, have been selected to be part of the Walmart brand, mega brand. Uh, bring me up to speed. How did this all come about? Over four years of hard work, trying to penetrate what I would say, one of the biggest brand association for us, Walmart, we, we're finally able to break in this year. Late last year, the conversation started becoming very meaningful, and then we're happy that they loved our product. And then today, we're at Walmart. So it's something to actually thank God for the team, for the partnership. I mean, this is what we've been envisaging in the last four years, like I told you, and we're glad that finally we made it happen. When it comes to retail or when it comes to wholesale, there is no better brand than Walmart. A lot of people even here where I am long for the day their products hit the shelves at Walmart. 
here you are, you are an African, uh, you are making products made in Africa and supplying them to Walmart. What does that mean for you going forward? So for me, I've always seen Walmart as one of the biggest targets we're going to pursue. And that was all, like I told you, in the last four years, we made sure that we kept a product that would fit into their standard. So for us, it's just not hitting Walmart. Remember, we've gone through a series of chain stores, series of partnership, global partnership. So Walmart was more like the final bus stop that we're actually hitting. The concept of the doll is far beyond just about financial remuneration. It's more about value creation, job employment, creating diversity, creating uh, heritage where kids get to know what they represent, who they are. I mean, be proud of what they, 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 they truly are, their natural self. So we are glad that this message is resonating with the rest of the world. And that's why today we are glad that this partnership with Walmart has finally paid off. Paul, what's so unique about uh, uh, the Unity Girl dolls that uh, Walmart has agreed to put on its shelves? It's all about inclusiveness. It's all about diversity. It's all about culture. I mean, um, you know, this month is actually the Black History Month. You know, it's the time to actually promote diversity, promote what, you know, the black race represents. So for me, I think Walmart on their own side probably would have seen that there is a gap, you know, in their range in terms of their dolls. So it's, it, it's easy for them to say, okay, for a brand like Walmart that actually prides itself as people who want to include everybody in their business model, I mean, it just makes a lot of sense for them to include unity doll that represent culture, represent that heritage, represent values. Because if you go to most of these big brands, you rarely see black dolls. You see the white skin dolls. And I mean, it's high time the Africans, you know, the blacks have to come out of those things where the kids seem to see them, themselves as a representation of the white skin doll rather than who they truly are. What matters to come to see that it's one of the gaps that they need to fill in, and Unity Door just fitted, fit the bill. And that's why we are in the shop and we are at Walmart today. A lot of people don't know this about me, but my first job here in the United States, I worked at Walmart as a photo lab manager. And one thing I know about uh, Walmart and how they uh, source for products, they're always looking for one quality, they're looking for things that are unique. In your particular case, what did it take to come to that conclusion for you to be able to sign that uh, multi-million dollar deal? I don't know what it is. I'm just saying a multi-million dollar deal with Walmart. Unity Dollar has been around for like six years now, and we've actually been keeping up with the big demand, even for partnership like Dufree. Dufree is one of the biggest duty-free stores. I mean, we're keeping up with those demands. Um, when you come to all the retail chain stores in Nigeria, we're keeping up with those demands. Remember. It's the local women that are making the clothes for these dolls. You know, we partner with Friends of the Disabled. These are young girls who are actually on wheelchair, who have skills in tailoring, you know. I mean, we have the capacity. It just goes to give us more challenge that as soon as we continue to gain that big global traction, it means invariably that we're going to increase our production chain and as well create more jobs. Bring it on, Paul. We're not, as, we're not scared of the challenge. We're just excited about the opportunity, and it gives us more to do and meet up big demands and big challenges that Walmart opens up for us. I believed in the team, and consistently we stayed focused, and here we are, www.walmart.com. Unity Doll is there trending. I can't wish for anything better. It's all about pursuing your dream. Well, we'll end it there. Thank you so much for your time, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Always a pleasure to be here. That was a Paul Orajika, CEO of Aldon Toys, based in Lagos, Nigeria. That's a today's Tech Report. Back to you, Esther. Wonderful, Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, please join Paul and Diho each Wednesday for another tech segment right here on Africa 54. Somto Ajanma is a popular radio presenter in Ogun State, Nigeria. Her adult conversations show discusses real-life challenges women in the country face every day. The show also and uh, listeners g g give our listeners a chance to participate in finding solutions. Olivia Chan reports. My name is Somto Titilayo Ajanma, and I'm a radio presenter on Women Radio WFM 91. Sumto Ajama's radio show discusses real-life challenges women in Nigeria face every day. 
and gives listeners a chance to participate in finding solutions. Always angry. So she's saying, what do I do? The numbers are she's part of a team of female presenters on the country's first radio station for women, acting as a platform for listeners to discuss issues like gender-based violence, domestic abuse, rape and other issues affecting women. The point that we are consistently um, harpooning on is the fact that we have these conversations, we put it out there, these conversations are had that typically would not be had, and then we get all this feedback from people because we are just speaking out and just making that voice, that female voice, that would not otherwise be heard, be heard. For cloth trader Alice Opiemi, listening to WFM changed her life. She battled domestic violence in her home for 20 years. I listened to their program a lot. The program, have, in short, made me to know a woman have rights in his husband's house. If not women radio, my husband is that type that will come. He will say, I will pack your load out of the house now. If you misbehave, I will pack your load. They are the ones that make me to know that the right he has in the house, that is also the right I have. In March 2015, the Nigerian Legislative Upper Chamber voted down the Gender and Equal Opportunities Bill, which aimed to accord women equal rights and impose measure to address discriminatory practices. As the country still struggles to address women's rights issues, the radio station has become an important platform for ordinary women to seek change. It has a reach of over 10 million listeners streaming in Nigeria. The team of broadcasters also uses other local languages on social media platforms and aims to start an NGO organization for victims of assault and gender-based violence in the near future. Olivia Chan of Reuters filed that report. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.